Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember, the King James Bible is the King James Bible believing, God fearing ministries, okay? Get your King James Bible out. I decided I'm going to use my huge Bible today, the one I'm doing a lot of my um, highlighting with my pencils and stuff, and then going through some old studies, getting back into some milk and some of the meat, and uh, just always reevaluating your life for the Lord and making sure you're living right and that your heart's in the right place. So I decided I'd use the big book today, large printing, and uh, Victoria's sitting over there, my manager Schnauzer, you be good, but if you want to turn with me to Proverbs 26.4, right? uh, last bit study we did together was answer not a fool, and we talked about mocking, because a lot of people will say, well, Jesus mocked, and people were mocking in the Old Testament, and that justifies us mocking today as Christians. And hopefully I've encouraged the brethren to err on the side of caution and had nothing to do with mocking. That's between God and the lost world. Lost world mocks God, God mocks the lost world. It's between, it's between them two. Okay. Best to be err on the side of caution and get mocking out of your life period. Okay. Sometimes you're going to state truth and people are going to misrepresent what the word mocking is. There's nothing wrong with standing for truth and pointing out truth when someone's doing something wrong. That's not mocking them. All right. But Proverbs 26, 4, we read, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be likened to him. And we talked about mocking. Today we're going to talk about verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. See, there's two conditions there. The first one we talked about is be like unto them. You don't want to fall into the trap of talking like the lost world. You definitely don't want to fall into the trap of acting like the lost world or looking like the lost world. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind, that you may prove, prove your life, your words, your actions, how you look. That you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? Be not conformed. And this is warning you that when you start talking like a fool, you might wind up looking like a fool acting like a fool. Okay? That's why it says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. There are certain ways you can answer him that make you look like a fool, like you're lost. Make you sound like you're lost. Okay? But now we're going to talk about verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There's the thing. Why would you answer a fool a certain way? Is there a certain way you're supposed to answer a fool according to his folly? Yes. Why? Because he'll be wise in his own conceit. What's the word conceit mean? Webster's 1820 Dictionary. Opinion, notion, fancy, imagination, fantastic notation, notion, I'm sorry, as a strange or odd conceit. In other words, to break it down, brothers and sisters Christ, it's saying feelings and opinions. They're basing their foundation, claiming to be, you know, uh, that their foundation is based off of feelings and opinions. Their own wisdom, the wisdom of men, is always going to be based off of feelings and opinions. Okay? We're supposed to be based off the Word of God, and we ask God for wisdom, and He gives us wisdom. So let's look at an example. I found the perfect example of someone using this verse properly, not misusing it. Yes, you are to answer a fool according to his folly when he's trying to be wise in his own conceit. It's about feelings and opinions, and that person is drawing others after him. Getting a little ahead of myself. So turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 17. Okay. 2 Corinthians 11, 17. Make sure you're turning in your Bibles. That's why I'm trying to do studies with turning. If I'm standing outside, I can't turn that well. But when I'm sitting here at the desk, I can turn with you. 2 Corinthians 11.17 That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. Um, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, the professing Christians at Corinth. Okay, He's talking to all of them. And this is what he says. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. It's very important. In other words, it's not the word of God. Spoken word, the Holy Spirit telling them this is coming from God, the Word of God. 
This is not coming from God. Because Paul's trying to answer a fool according to his folly. Lest he be wise in his own conceit. So let's keep going. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were, foolishly. And this confidence of boasting, foolishly, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but can a Christian act foolishly, talk foolishly, look foolishly? Foolishly means you're looking like someone who's lost. You're acting like someone who's lost. You're talking like someone who's lost. Yes, someone who's truly saved can fall into the trap of looking, acting, and speaking foolishly. Okay? But a fool is someone who's lost. When you say that someone's a fool, be careful. You gotta make sure that person is lost. And there's times where I've said people are fools because they're lost. According to scripture. Their life lines up with scripture when it comes to a false convert, someone who's lost. But we can't just throw that around. But using foolishly, when we say someone's acting foolishly, what you're saying is they're acting like someone who's lost. And this confidence of boasting. Okay, he's saying he's going to speak, if we read down further, he speaks as a fool. Okay, that's why I titled it, Speaking as a Fool. I speak as a fool. Okay, he's going to start speaking foolishly. He's going to start talking like the lost world talks. Not a saved sinner. But also notice that he points it out ahead of time. He doesn't just do it. He points it out. This isn't coming from the Lord. I'm speaking foolishly. Okay. Verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh. That was the biggest thing that was going on in the first and second Corinthians. You have false converts coming in, and they were getting people to glory after the flesh, elevate the flesh. Right? Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. But remember, he's speaking as a fool. It's not something you do. You don't glory after the flesh. Paul is not being a hypocrite. He specifically said, I, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were, foolishly. Okay. 19, it says, For ye suffer fools gladly. Not people that are acting foolish. Fools gladly. Another verse in First and Second Corinthians where Paul is calling out false converts. You have people coming in, fools, pretending to be Christians. And you're suffering them gladly. Okay. Seeing, your, seeing ye yourselves are wise. What did we just read? Lest he be wise in his own conceit in Proverbs 26.4. These people think they're wise. Seeing yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. Okay. You read through the Bible. They're always trying to bring them back under the old law. They're trying to do everything to make it about works and their flesh. And not about God's grace. The easy believism. They turn belief into works. Okay. It's all about what you did. You earned salvation. Okay. And they're trying to bring you, a lot of times, they're trying to bring you back under bondage. You've got to go to the Babel buildings. You've got to put on a nice suit and tie. And you've got to do all this stuff that's not in Scripture. But ultimately, the bondage there also, for the us, is the people that are obviously trying to say you have to do good works to stay saved and you can lose your salvation and whatnot. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they're suffering fools gladly. They're coming in, they're preaching another gospel, they're preaching another Jesus, and they're getting people to receive another spirit. And those that are saved, they're messing them up. And that's the whole point, to destroy their testimony so they can't be used of God. Okay. Other than as a bad example. But they're trying to bring you in bondage. If a man devour you, take all you have. Destroy you. Like I said, destroy Christians. Destroy their testimony. Okay. If a man take of you, that's the one that's like, they take all you have. Donations. You've got to donate to a dead building. And you've got to do this. And you've got to do that. You know, it's not based in scripture. If a man exalt himself... That's what the, we're going to key thing here. These people are coming in, they're exalting themselves, they're flashing their credentials. Look at me, I'm a PhD, THD, whatever. I went to six years of Bible seminar and Bible college, and, and I've done this for the Lord, and I've done that. Look at me, look at me, look at me. They're exalting themselves. Okay? They're coming in, they're exalting themselves, and all these Christians that are newly saved, babes in Christ, they're looking at them going, ah. Well, they're wise. Maybe I can be wise too. 
And they start doing what they do. They start mimicking what they're doing. It starts becoming a flesh thing. Right? If a man smite you on the face, that one's an interesting one because I've actually, it's rare, but you've seen it where some places where he's got a Holy Spirit, like those, uh, what do you call it, angelicans, uh, evangelical, where they're really out of control. And I've seen someone slap someone before. Let's get that demon out. They smite you across the face. Uh, you don't smite me across the face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, it's just, yeah, it can get that bad, but they're suffering these fools gladly. Come on in. Okay. Suffering fools gladly. Psalms 51 3. Okay, keep your hands there. Psalms 51 3. So we're going to keep going through that story. But Psalms 51 3. Is that the right one? 53.1, one. I'm sorry. I had it backwards. Psalms 53.1. The fool hath said in his heart, not his head, his heart. They always say that people miss heaven by 13 inches because it's up here and it's not down here. There's a difference between knowing God and understanding God. And a lot of times people don't even know God. They're just parrying. They got this head knowledge. That's what I do by knowing it's head knowledge. They're repeating what someone else says. Because the Bible says they profess that they know me, but in works they deny me. Why? Because they don't understand God. It's not down here. This says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Not in the lips. I know the heart can come out. Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I understand that. But it's not a head thing. It's a heart issue. There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. Okay. So when you see fool there, people automatically think a fool is someone who just flat out denies God verbally, like an atheist. But as we're reading here, Paul's calling false converts fools. Why? They preach another Jesus, they preach another gospel, they're receiving another spirit, and these guys, in their heart... They're denying the capital G God. That's another thing to look there. Does it say, the fool has said in their heart there is no gods, plural, or lowercase g God? No, it says capital G God, singular. Anybody who vehemently, I'm going to do this, anybody who vehemently stands for the Trinity, you're a fool. The fool has said in their heart there is no capital G God, singular. And people will say, well, yeah, we believe there's a capital G God, but then you have God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You had more gods there. There's more than one God. You deny that there's one capital G God, period. No God the Son, no God the, F the Holy Spirit. Just God, period. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, um, there's but one capital G God, the Father. One God, the Father. That's it. There is no God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Chapter and verse, you won't find it. It's not in there. But why do we call them fools? Well, no, because they're not atheists. They profess to know God. They profess to be Christians. But why do we call them fools? Because the fool has said in his heart, there is no capital G, God singular. There are false converts out there that are trying to infiltrate the body of Christ Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, us, brothers and sisters of Christ, are trying to infiltrate us, and they're fools. Because in their heart, they say there is no God singular. They don't believe in the God of the King James Bible. They don't believe in Jesus, who is God, fully and completely, of the King James Bible. They believe in God's plural. Three lowercase g gods that make up one capital G God. You can't have three capital G gods that make up one capital G God because that's four capital G gods. But anyway, I can go off. We've already done videos and studies on that. Didn't mean to go too far. But the thing is, is uh, Titus 1.16, we we'll don't have to turn there. They profess that they know God. Up here. But in works, they deny Him. The works come out to show that down here, they don't. They don't know God, they deny God. Because it says, but in works, they deny Him. They're a fool. That falls under the definition of a fool. They can profess to be Christians all they want. But when their works 
the fruit, the changed life, it's not there. They're denying Jesus Christ. Being abominable and disobedient, like we just read there about the fool, and unto every good work reprobate. Their good works are worthless. They're worthless. They will not save them. They're also worthless because they're not getting any rewards for them at the judgment seat of Christ because they're not going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to be at the great, great white throne. That's why their works are reprobate. They're good works. They're worthless. They might be good works according to the Bible, but they're worthless. Okay? These are the fools that they're suffering gladly. They're coming in. They're exalting themselves. Look at me. You guys need to follow me. You need to do what I say. Not what Paul said. No, 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 do what Paul said. Do what I say. I speak for God. And it totally goes against what Paul had taught them and when he led them to Christ. It's like today you have all these people, these preachers, and these wolves in sheep's clothing that teach you to listen to what I say, not what the Word of God says. And that's what's going on. And brothers and sisters of Christ, another thing I'm going to kick real quick is I've seen you guys make comments in other people's channels, like Brother Brian um, and some of the other uh, King James Video Ministers like that. Well, what about this guy over here? What about that guy over there? And it's like, we've already taught you time and time again. Are they King James Bible believers? Oh yeah, they're King James Bible believers. Okay, what are the major doctrines? What about this? What about that? The yeah, changed life and this. And then you go and they always say, well, what about this person? I, I, I've had wolves in sheep's clothing. I believe they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Come into other people's channels and sometimes on my old videos. And they will say, I believe that Brother Brian, King James Video Ministries, and this other guy are the only good Bible-believing, God-fearing men left out there. And you go to look at the other guy and the other guy is not a Bible-believing, God-fearing man at all. What's going on there? They're trying to draw away disciples after somebody else. And why do I say that? Um, when uh, they had a big split from King James Video Ministries and a lot of these false converts and these fakes fled to, uh, and went back to just Robert Breaker, there had people over there that were saying, the only two true Bible-believing, God-fearing men out there that I trust is Robert Breaker and Brian. You, Brian, you're teaching great and everything. And you guys, you guys need to check out Robert Breaker. You guys need, and they kept doing it all the time in the comments. You guys, Brother Brian's great teacher, and you guys need to check out Robert Breaker. They both teach a different gospel. That right there is enough to make a red flag with that person. What's wrong with you? Something's not right in the head. Something's wrong. They both preach and teach a different gospel gospel, a different plan, same gospel, different plan of salvation, how to find God's grace. When you say, what do you mean by same gospel? The gospel is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the plan of salvation where they take things out so you can't find God's grace. But the whole point is they taught two different ones. What's going on? There's people that go, oh, okay, and they're suffering fools gladly. Fools are coming in to draw away disciples after them. Fools are coming in to destroy Christians. That's what's going on here. Okay? Um, Matthew 5, 7. Matthew 5, 7. Hold your hand there in 2 Corinthians because we're still going to keep going. But Matthew 5, 7. I'm really going to kick this suffering fools gladly. Because it's happening more and more often, and we're seeing more and more brethren fall away. They start falling back into the flesh. The ways of the world. Right here. Matthew 15, 7. I'm sorry. Matthew 15, 7. If I didn't say it right. This one you got to turn five pages per chapter. <laughs> Victoria's scratching over there. Matthew 15, 7, it says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I'm a man of God, too. You should listen to me, because I'm a man of God, too. With their lips. Oh, I believe in the Word of God. I'm a King James Bible-believing, God-fearing man. With their lips. But look at this. But their heart is far from
from me. Their heart is far from me. Verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Remember what the word conceit, conceit is. Be wise in their own conceit. Feelings and opinions. It's what I say. I am the final authority. The commandments of men. You have fools coming in and destroying the body of Christ and getting them to go the way of the world. And Paul comes in and catches it. Okay. Uh, don't have to turn there, but back in Isaiah, it says, Isaiah's prophesied you saying, you go back to Isaiah 29, 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near with me with their mouths, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. Let that one sink in. The fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men? I mean, he asked the professing Christian, do you fear God? Oh yeah, I know God. He, him and me, we're best pals, we're best buddies. I didn't ask if you knew God. I said, do you fear God? Yeah, to fear God is to know God. No, it isn't. What's going on today? They're changing the definition of the word fear. You don't have to fear God. You can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. Just put it on my tab. They change the precepts of what fear is. The average professing Christian in this world that goes to these Babel buildings, uh, even online, a lot of these professing Christians out there, you look at their life and you start talking to them about the Word of God, there's no fear. Godhead versus the Trinity. You're adding a title for God that's not there. Where's the fear? There is no fear. Right? Eternal security. The Bible says you're sealed until the day of redemption. You're not to... 2 Timothy 2.15 <clears throat> Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're sealed until the day of redemption. But when you're telling people you can lose your salvation and trying to promise them liberty as we talked about in another study, but you bring them, but you yourselves are the servants of corruption, where's the fear? And we could go on, Bible verse issue. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. If you don't have God's word, how can you hide it in your heart? Where's the fear when these people speak against the word of God? Okay? And I'll even throw this out there real quick. Poking a lot of the Bible believing Christians out there. Some I believe are saved, some I believe are false, but I'm talking directly to the ones that are saved. And here's a little poke. Okay? What about Christmas? Where's the fear? You're inviting Satan into your home one month out of the year. Where's the fear? Proven fact. I've done videos. Other brethren have done videos. Proven fact. And I can go into all the things that I struggle with. Uh, I had to have fear, real fear, when it came to video games, movies, TV shows, anime. Fear. I go through all these other sins. Where is the fear of the Lord? What's going on here? Okay? you got these people come in saying, I'm a Christian too, I'm a Christian too. But there's no fear. And when, the, when someone goes, wait a minute, I don't see fear in you, what do they do? They try to change the definition of fear. They try to misquote scripture. Oh, you know, the Bible says that the Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of peace and of a sound mind. That's talking about the world. Not towards God, that's towards the world. We don't fear the world anymore. They come in here and bust down this door and they arrest me and hang me or cut my head off in front of everybody in the main city and everything. I'm not afraid. I want to be with my Lord and Savior in heaven. I'm willing to die for Jesus Christ. That's the fear it's talking about, what they can do to you. The Bible says, don't fear them that's able to destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You're to fear God, not this world. That's what that verse is talking about. But they'll misquote scripture, or they'll try to change the definition of fear. Let that sink in, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't be deceived. Don't suffer fools gladly. They don't line up with the Bible. They're a fool. Get them out. Get them out of here. Throw them out, as they say. Throw them out. They're not welcome. Stop watching ministries when you realize God opens your eyes through the scriptures, not feelings and opinions. That person's false. 
Stop watching him. Stop having anything to do with him. Well, I just watch him, you know, to see what he's doing. And I don't watch him anymore, period. All right. Um, Romans 1.22 talks about, you know, I've turned there, but professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Getting, when you get wise in your own conceit, you, you show that you're a fool or you start acting foolish. Acting, speaking, looking foolish. When you start becoming wise in your own conceit. When you get, when you get told, this isn't that big of a deal, and it's just about you, your heart's feelings and opinions, you're going to start going the way of the lost world. You're going to get sidetracked. You're not going to stay the course. Okay. Be careful with that. Make sure that it's about the Word of God. Chapter and verse, chapter and verse. Comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Anybody can grab one verse and try to make it say anything they want. What's the context? You compare it with Scripture and Scripture. Okay. So I put it here. Men are coming in, glorifying their flesh, exalting themselves, and getting people to follow them. That's what's going on. Do we see that today? Absolutely. These Babel buildings. Don't you dare question the man of God. But that man of God doesn't line up with Scripture. He's a false. He's a fake. He's a wolf. And shit. Don't you dare question the man of God. Get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. See, we're supposed to do that to people that are false. But if I come in, if someone comes in and says, Hey, here's Scripture. I'm supposed to say, okay, and talk with that man about the Word of God. When they're showing the Word of God. These guys, it's all about uh, feelings and opinions. Get out of here. You don't, you don't dare question the man of God. Yeah, but the Scripture says, who cares what the Scripture says? They don't say that out loud, but that's their actions, their works. Say, I don't care what the Scriptures say. I'm denying the God of Scripture. Right. Now, sometimes they're bringing them back under bondage. We talked about this. Devouring, destroying you. Uh, taking, uh, taking from you. Money. Okay? Now, here's the thing that i got to talk about to get it just because I really want to drive this home when it comes to them bringing in. This is how serious it is. This is why Paul talks like a, uh, speaks foolishly to try to open their eyes because this is a serious, serious thing. Fools are coming in and they're devouring them and messing them up and destroying their walk with the Lord. And they, they can do that to you too, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you let them. If you suffer fools gladly. Now, here's the thing that I remember, a story, a true story. And a lot of them have true stories like this. But you have a domesticated dog. Okay? And you go to move out in the wilderness, you know, out in the, in the woods. And you have that dog, and that dog is just so friendly, and you pet him and everything. And all of a sudden, you've got wild dogs out there. What do you think is going to happen when that domesticated dog runs out there to go, Hey, I'm going to go hang out with these wild dogs. Hey, how's it going, guys? I'm, I'm just here to be friendly and everything. What's going to happen? Those wild dogs are going to devour that domesticated dog. They're going to destroy it. They're going to eat it. Let that sink in. When you start to think you can suffer fools gladly, you're that saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian man that's told, or woman, that's told not to fellowship with the lost world. You're not to conform to this world. You're not to be a friend of the world, the ways of the world, sin. Okay, what happens? These wolves in sheep's clothing, these wild dogs, we're going to get to it, they're dogs, are going to come in and you're thinking, well, I can, we can get along and we can be best friends and we can just get along and they're going to devour you. They'll destroy you. They'll destroy your walk with the Lord. If you're truly saved, they'll destroy your walk with the Lord. They will destroy your testimony. So you can't be used of anything other than a bad example. And if you're not saved, they're there to prevent people from getting saved. But he's addressing saved people. So what this is about is they're coming in and they're destroying these people's walks with the Lord. It's a serious, serious thing. Okay? Back to 2 Corinthians 11, 21. So here he is. Paul's like, he says, 
that I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly. He's going to speak like a lost person who denies God in their hearts. 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit whensoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. He puts it in there. I speak foolishly. A lot of people say, well, if you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. You need to say you're being sarcastic. Paul did. There is no, you just assume he's sarcastic. No, you need to say it. Okay. I speak foolishly. I am bold also. I am bold also. This is what's, it's not funny, it's sad, but the thing is, is Paul puts him to shame. All these people who think they're great men, Paul puts him to shame. Paul never would have said this if this wasn't going on. He never would have spoken foolishly if it wasn't to turn people around. This isn't stuff you brag about. But let's listen to what Paul says. Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Okay? He's saying, I am more. He's speaking as a fool. He said that there. Why? Because those people aren't Christians. You're suffering fools gladly. Those are fools. They're lost. But he's speaking as a fool. Okay? I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Let that one sink in. That's a whole other study. <laughs> you mean Paul died a few times? 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. I'm getting that carnival preaching going because, you know, he's speaking as a fool. What's going on here? He's glorifying himself, but everything he's speaking is truth. And he's putting those people to shame. He's got more credentials than those people could ever have, these false converts that are coming in. And he's putting them to shame. But I can just see him getting, you know, all charismatic. 26. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, which is what's going on here. 27. In weariness and painfulness. Like talking like this is, is getting weariness and painful. I can't see how anybody can speak like that, the carnival preachers. So just imagine carnival preaching, but I'm just going to be reading. In watchings often, and hunger and thirst, there's times he went without eating and drinking. And fasting often, and cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He's taking care of all the churches. He's going through, okay, here's a church here, I've led these people to Christ. There's a church over here. All right. The church is the body of Christ, it's saved people, and he's taking care of them. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Question mark. Who is offended and I burn not? If I here, here it is. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. And we get into that. If he's gonna glory, he's gonna glory in his infirmities. But there's a point to it. We'll get to it. Verse 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Everything he's saying here is truth. But he's elevating his flesh. Not, not like he's not really elevating his flesh. He's speaking like a fool that elevates his flesh. And it's all about him. He's glorifying. He's showing how they're glorifying themselves. Do I do that? I'm the one that showed you Jesus Christ. I preached the plan of salvation to you. I've told you the way of salvation, the way of a Christian, the life of a Christian. I'm the one that's told you, do I do this? No, I've never done that. These people, that doesn't mean anything. If you're going to glory, glory in your infirmities. Mm -hmm. 
Why? Because we're going to see here, glorifying, glorying in your infirmities, you're really glorifying God. It's about God. It's not about you. Now, like I said before, Paul speaks like a fool and his credentials crush those that are leading the body of Christ astray. Just totally crushes them. Okay? Okay, what does it mean to speak as a fool? We've already talked about this. I got ahead of myself, but we talked about it. Uh, Psalms 14.1, it's another one. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Okay? The lost world glorifies their flesh. That's what it's always about. They're elevating themselves up. They're glorifying their flesh. These false converts, you watch them long enough, it's about their flesh. They glorify their flesh and they elevate themselves up. It's not about the Word of God. It's not about glorifying Jesus Christ. Why? Because you can't glorify Jesus Christ in your flesh, in your sin. We'll say it that way. Okay? That's the difference between lost and saved. Saved give God glory in all things. The lost, they take glory for themselves. They might give God glory for things over here, but they take glory for themselves. Remember what the Bible says, that they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? They serve the creature more than they serve the Creator? So, they give God glory. You'll see them do it. They give God glory, but they hold glory for themselves, too. They take glory for themselves more than they're glorifying God. They're supposed to give God glory in all things. Okay. But what does Paul mean by, If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 16. Go over to the next verse, or next chapter, I'm sorry. Next chapter, 2 Corinthians 12, 6. He goes through and he starts speaking like a saved man. Speaking like a fool, done and over with. Now he's talking about the Lord and the walk of a Christian. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 12, 6. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool. A fool glories about himself and lifts himself up and glorifies himself above God. He wants people to worship him. He's above the Word of God. You don't dare question the man of God. He's untouchable. Uh, no, he's not. I shall not be a fool. If I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. Above? Like untouchable? Like there was times where they thought they were gods? I think it was Peter. It was Peter or Paul, I kind of got that one messed up, it's on who, but they thought they were gods and they were renting their clothes and falling down saying, don't worship us, don't worship us, we're not gods. Only worship Jesus Christ. Or that he heareth of me. Another way to look at that too is people saying, Paul saying, I'm not above the word of God. I'm not above the standards that I'm laying out. You guys got to keep him, but I don't. He's not above them. You hold him accountable. We hold everybody accountable to the Word of God. No matter how high up they try to be, you still hold them accountable to the Word of God. Remember the Bible said, the greatest shall be the least, and the least shall be the greatest. That's how you're supposed to live. You're a servant. When you get into ministry, you're a servant serving the body of Christ. You're not their master. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. There's times where brothers and sisters in Christ, I've seen it in ministries, uh, by saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing men, where they start to get up there, and God put a thorn in the flesh to bring them back down to here, where they belong. Okay, Here's the body of Christ. Here's the man that's in ministry. They start going like this. God will give them a thorn, bring him back down here. And anytime they start going like this again, God will give them a thorn to bring him down here. Okay, to buffet you. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, is where it goes to explain it, 
Most glad therefore will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. They're probably asking, well, why didn't you ever tell us this before? You really went through all that and you've done all... Why didn't you ever... Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. God be the glory. It's not about me. That's why I don't go around bragging and saying everything that I do for the Lord or everything the Lord... I do, I do say everything the Lord's done for me. But you don't go around bragging about everything you've gone through for the Lord and the suffering... It, there's times where it might come up, brothers and sisters of Christ, one-on-one -on -one with someone else, and let them know, hey, I've been where you are. I've been through what you've been through. And you give them verses to encourage them. Because oftentimes you wish someone would have given you verses to encourage you, the Word of God. But that's what Paul's saying. It's saying it's for Christ's sake. It's not for yours. It's not for the world's. It's not for my sake. It's for Christ's sake. Okay? For when I am weak, then am I strong. I can testify to that, brothers and sisters in Christ. My life as a Christian, any time that I've fallen flat on my face, I turn to the Lord. You see that a lot in the Old Testament. When they fall flat on their face and punishment came and everything, they turn to the Lord. That's one thing. The other thing is, is you can have where the cares of this world, persecution, bad things can come your way, and it reminds you that it's not about me. If it's about me and my strength, I'll fail every time. It's about the Lord. Okay? I'm probably getting ahead of myself because we still got some reading to do. No, that's where we stopped for a second. Uh, right there where it says, For when I'm weak, then am I strong. If you remember Philippians 4.13. What is Philippians 4.13.10? You can turn over there. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now I remember listening to Peter Ruckman. He goes, do you still sin? Well, yeah. Well, then how do you explain that? And I'm like, I almost like go like this going, to us who are saved, we look at that and go, it's simple to explain. When you sin, are you going through Jesus Christ? No. What are you going through? Your own wisdom? Your flesh? Your wise and your own conceit? You start falling into the flesh? The temptation of the flesh, and you choose to sin, what are you going through? Are you going through Jesus Christ when you sin? Absolutely not. It's so easy to answer, but he made it out like it was so hard to answer, Peter Ruckman, on that study I was watching. No, it isn't. It's not hard at all. I can do all things through Christ. Through Christ. You go through His Word. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Through Christ, through His Word, it'll tell you how to do things. His Word will give you strength. It'll give you encouragement. It'll give you hope, the blessed hope. We're not going to be down here for much longer, brothers and sisters of Christ, than blessed hope. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day. Not a month from now, not two months from now at the elections, not next year. Not the next five to eight years. Today, he could come back right now while I'm doing this video. Okay. But you have to go through Christ. I've heard so many people, well, I'm trying to kick this sin. I'm trying to kick that sin. I just can't do it. I, 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 I can't seem to do it. What am I doing wrong? You're not going through Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I am. If you've gone through Jesus Christ, he'd have gotten it out of your life. It's that simple. There's a part of you that's holding back. You're either trying to do it of your own strength, or there's a part of you that you're listening to, your flesh telling you, oh, give me excuses and, and this and that, and you're not doing what the Word tells you to do. Whatever that temptation, you get all the temptation out of your life. Oh, but that means I have to give up friends. It's a whole other discussion. But you have to give up friends. You have to give up a lot of things in your life to get temptations out so you can live a godly life and He can get that stuff out of your life. But you do it through Christ. That's where your strength lies. When I am weak, then am I strong. That's why he glories in his infirmities, because he's glorying in Jesus Christ. He spoke as a fool to open their eyes. And he also verbally said, I speak as a fool. There wasn't just something where if you don't understand my sarcasm or me speaking like a fool, then you just, 
You just need you just don't get it. No, you have to say it. Sorry, brothers out there that are doing that in ministry. You have to say it. I speak as a fool. That's going to take some getting used to. <laughs> There's times where I'm being sarcastic and i got to remember that I need to say I speak as a fool. This is hitting me as much as I'm hoping it's hitting you, brothers and sisters of Christ, this teaching. Okay. Now at this point, we already pointed out, again, he's not speaking like a fool anymore. He's talking to the brethren like a saved man, because he is saved. Not like, he is saved, but he's speaking as a saved man and no longer speaking as a fool. Okay? He's being serious. The biggest thing I keep putting down here, brothers and sisters Christ, is you can glory in the flesh of the Lord. You can't do both. Okay? You can rely on your strength or you can rely on the Lord's strength. You cannot do both. It's just not possible. When you're glorifying the flesh, you're not glorifying God. When you're glorifying God, you're not glorifying the flesh. They're contrary one to another. There's no way to do both of them at the same time. Just no way. Same thing when it comes to strength. If you're relying on your strength, you're not relying on God's strength. And if you're relying on God's strength, you're not relying on yours. You cannot do both. Okay? Once again, I'm warning you, Paul's warning these people that full, they're suffering fools gladly. Lost people are coming in and destroying everything. They're turning them from the Word of God. They're turning them back to their flesh and to the ways of the world and just destroying them. This is very serious. This is the example, the best example I could find of somebody taking that verse, speaking, uh, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. They were teaching these men, these people I believe that are really saved, that you can be wise in your own eyes. Yea, hath God said. And they started messing them up. And Paul had to do something drastic, speaking as a fool, to open their eyes to bring them back. Saying, hey, stick to the Word of God. Stick to what I'm preaching and what I'm teaching you. Okay, stick to the real Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be about God, glorifying God, not your flesh. Now, here's the thing though. Was this the first time Paul just saw this happening and goes, well, you know, I'm just going to speak like a fool right off the bat? No, he didn't. Okay, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 1.24. 1 Corinthians one twenty four, the very first chapter in Corinthians. Let's read through this. Is this. Was that the first time Paul was trying to tell them that you don't glorify your flesh? You glorify God. It's about Jesus Christ. Your life is about pleasing Jesus Christ, the changed life. You're supposed to be living a life of Christ. The Corinthians were carnal as a whole, and Paul comes in there and time and time again keeps questioning their salvation, telling them they need to check whether they be in the faith, prove your own selves. They had to prove that they were in the faith. Okay. What's going on here? They're very flesh-driven. When you're newly saved, you're going to have a lot of flesh problems. A lot of flesh problems when you're newly saved. God's got a lot of work to do. When I newly got saved, I looked at my life and said, Oh Lord, you've got a lot of work to do. And do you know what God said? Open your Bible, let's get started. Open my Bible, start doing some Bible studies, start learning instruction in righteousness, the do's and the don'ts, things I'm supposed to stand for, things I'm supposed to abhor, and I, God just started cleaning up my life. It started at salvation and continued going. Okay? As far as my heart's desire, started at salvation, and after God saved me, then it started going, cleaning my life up. Okay. Verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye, yourself, for ye, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. There's wise men after the Lord. The Lord gives them wisdom. But this is all about wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many, not many mighty, 
You know, they're not using God's strength, their own strength. Not many noble are called. They elevate themselves up. I'm high and mighty. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, but of him, now it goes to the saved, are ye in Christ Jesus. First you talk about lost, now it's talking about saved. There's a contrast. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, whom of God has made unto us wisdom. Where do we get our wisdom? From God. You ask God for wisdom and he gives it to you. And righteousness. Right. Be, Jesus said, Be ye holy as I am holy. How is that possible? God's righteousness is imputed to you. Jesus is God. His righteousness is imputed to you. And he takes over and starts telling you what to do and how to live your life. Right. And sanctification and redemption. Sanctification, cleaning up your life. Redemption. Where two-thirds redeemed, people say. Right. The Bible, uh, our souls in heaven... As it is in our bodies, it can be in two places at once. Uh, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Our soul. Some people say spirit. I believe it's the soul. It's in heaven and it's in our bodies. Okay. We're two-thirds redeemed. We still have this body of uh, flesh that's not redeemed yet. Okay. 31. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. See, Paul talked to them ahead of time and said, Hey, first time I came to you, I tried to let you guys know it's about glorifying God. And you guys forgot that and got off track. These fools, these wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in and they're leading you astray. And they're getting you to go back to being the way you were before you got saved. Being God, your own gods. Knowing good and evil. Live however you want to live. Do whatever you want to do. God's word's not that important. Uh, yes, it is. Now notice that there it says, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. But it says, according to as it is written. When it says that, it means it was written before time. This isn't something brand new. This isn't, okay, now this dispensation only, are we to glorify God? No. Turn back to Jeremiah 9, 24. Sometimes I have a hard time finding some of the old books. <laughs> Jeremiah 9, 24. We might go off a little bit, doing a teaching on this and make it go a little bit longer because this is important. What's going on there? Why did Paul have to speak like a fool? Because they were glorifying their flesh. And he had to speak like a fool to open their eyes. And then he starts speaking like the saved man that he is, preaching the word of God. And getting them saying, okay, here's the full part, to get them go, okay, yeah, that's pretty foolish, I'm sorry. And then he brings them right back to the word of God. Okay. Verse 24, 9, 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Understand and know. You've got to have both. Not up here, it's got to be both. It's got to be down here too. If it never makes it down here, you'll never get saved. God will never save you. True biblical repentance, down here. Getting ahead of myself. Let's keep reading. Know with me that I am the Lord. Capital L, Lord. Jesus Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 again. There is but one capital L, Lord. Jesus Christ. That I am the Lord. Jesus is God fully and completely. Do you fear him? Oh no, we're best buddies and everything. And, and I can slap him on the side. I can go sit on his throne and say, what's up, buddy? Where's the fear? Where's the reverence? True reverence is fear mingled with respect. Where is it? Okay. Not only do you know it, do you understand it? Your heart, the life you live, shows that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Which exercises, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, 
and righteousness in the earth. Those three things. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. He delights when you know and understand that He is, I am the Lord. There's actually four things. I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. I want to talk about those four things real quick. Okay? For I delight, uh, you can turn to these, but I'm going to just read them out real quick. For I delight, for the, in these things I delight. Okay? Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You want to please God. These things He delights in. You want to please Him? I am the Lord. Psalms 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The good understanding have all they that do His commandments. Do His commandments. You want to understand God? This is how you understand God. You study, you read the Word, you study the Word, you pray over the Word, Lord give me understanding, and you obey the Word. That's how you have understanding here, is when you're obeying the Word of God. That's why we always keep saying the changed life is a physical change. What's in your heart is going to reflect how you live your life for Christ. Are you in Christ Jesus? Prove your own selves. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord. Do you fear God? Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's how you can tell when you're dealing with a lost person. The Word of God says, The Word of God says, oh, Do you always have to keep going to that book? Come on now, can't we just talk without that book? Who are you to judge me? You know, you worship that book. And on and on, they despise wisdom and instruction. God's Word says this, but God's Word says that. Well, I don't believe that. And, and you know what? It, and they start going off of their own, their wise and their own conceit. They start going off feelings and opinions. You want to please God and glorify God? Fear the Lord. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Well, that's the next one we're going to. I'm sorry, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't just love wisdom and instruction. Cling to wisdom and instruction. It pleases the Lord when you fear Him. And hold on to His words, His every word. I, I want to please God. I don't, I don't want to... I fear God. I don't want Him angry at me. I don't want to have Him disappointed in me. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. They take that, and they try, remember we talked about it, they try to twist it and say, well, they take the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but let's take off the, is the beginning of the wisdom, wisdom, let's take that part out, and, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, let's take out of the holy is understanding, and then they say, the fear of the Lord is to know God. That's all it is. They make a mess of scripture. That goes back up to the one where the fools despise wisdom and instruction. We come back to them and say, no, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Actual fearing God. That temptation comes in, you're going to fear God and say, I don't want to sin against God. Something in your life that's not supposed to be there, God points it out to you. You're like, okay, I'm getting out of my life because I fear God. The world tries to get you to do things their way. I ain't doing things their way because I fear God. Know that I am the capital L Lord. That's what Jesus was saying there in Jeremiah. That I am the Lord. It pleases God. Okay? He delights it when people have uh, the right reverence and fear of God, of Him. Okay? Next one, ex exercise love and kindness. Loving kindness. Remember, we're just barely touching on some of this stuff. Salvation. Okay? Loving kindness, salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. I had a brother that asked on one of Brian's uh, studies, he's like, does godly sorrow come before repentance? And Brian read it and said, yes, and I'm sorry, brother, but you're wrong. You're so wrong. What does the verse actually say? For godly sorrow 
worketh repentance to salvation. That godly sorrow doesn't come before repentance. That godly sorrow is what makes the repentance work. It's what's really true repentance, in other words. The best way I can say it is the flashlight. You've got a flashlight with no batteries. And you're clicking it, and you're clicking it, and you're clicking it. And you got all these people saying, well, I tried repentant, I tried repentant, it never works, it never works. Then I fell for the, then they find the only believe crowd, easy believism. Oh, and I'm saved. I can live like the world, look like the world, act like the world, be wise in my own conceit, and I'm saved. But they keep clicking that thing, and it never works. Why? It's got no batteries. Flashlight with no batteries, you can hit that button all you want, and it's never going to work. What makes it work? Godly sorrow. What is godly sorrow? When you're sorry for something, you understand that what you did was wrong. You understand the consequences, but you're sorry for what you did. You're sorry for the consequences. And when you're sorry for doing something, you don't want to do it again. If I'm sorry for hurting you, brother or sister in Christ, if I'm truly sorry down here in my heart, my heart's desire is I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do that thing that's hurting you. Not that we can hurt God, but you understand what I'm saying. For godly sorrow, the godly sorrow is the batteries, repentance is the flashlight. And what does it do? It lights the way to salvation. Now you hit that button, that light comes on, it points you to salvation. When you come truly broken, true biblical repentance, having sorrow for sinning against God, it will point you to Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Okay? It will point to you not just knowing the gospel, but understanding the gospel. It really means something to you. Okay? Exercising loving kindness. You know what pleases God? Getting saved. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you and He saves you. He delights in saving you. He loves saving people. He doesn't want people to go to hell. His will is that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. The hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for us. Think about that. If God hated us so much, then why wasn't hell prepared for us? It's not prepared for us. It's prepared for Satan and his angels, the demons, the fallen angels, the third of the angels that he takes, okay? Exercising loving kindness, what about the life of a Christian? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He still exercises loving kindness even in the life of a Christian. You fall flat on your face, brother, sister of Christ, He'll forgive you. You come to Him broken. All right? That brokenness starts at salvation and it continues. You don't just come to God broken at salvation and then you're finished. You can go ahead and do whatever you want and live however you want. That's, you never came to God broken. If you truly came to God broken with godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you sinned against Him and your life of a Christian, when you fall flat on your face, you fail the Lord, you fail the brethren, okay, you fail yourself because you, you, you love the Lord and you want to do right by Him, you fall flat on your face, you're going to have that brokenness again. And you're going to come before the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me. Get this out of my life. Help me to start speaking right. Help me to start saying it right. Help me to get my heart back in the right spot where it's supposed to go. You want to be corrected and get things back to the way that God says they should be. Okay? And His loving kindness, He will forgive you. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Exercise loving kindness. How often do we do this? I pray you're doing it every day, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm thanking God for a million things every day. I'm sitting there and I go through and I look at everything. I've probably thanked Him for the same things a million times. And you know what? I'm going to be thanking Him again for a million times. It's not a pat on my back. It's me letting you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, please, you guys need to be doing this too. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Another thing about his exercising his loving kindness, he likes to be told, thank you. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve any of this. 
I got my clothes, I've got food in my stomach, that be, be there with content. Food and raiment, be there with content. Everything is just extra. It's a blessing from the Lord. Okay? Exercise and love and kindness, that's, the, that's what God delights in. Notice how all this goes back to Jesus Christ. You're glorifying Jesus Christ. When we talked about the first part, um, the first part there, I'm the Lord, about fearing the Lord, it's about Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, capital L Lord. Exercise love and kindness, it's about Jesus Christ. The next one, judgment. Turn to Romans 14.10. I'm just trying to get through these because these can be a huge study, but just something for you guys to start on, and you can go on each one of these and do your own studies. I've done studies on judgment before, but Romans 10, 14, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Who does all the judging? Remember all the judgment has been given to the Son? Jesus Christ, that's the God that you're giving your account to. Singular. Only one God, Jesus Christ. Fully and completely. God the Father and Jesus Christ are one. I and my Father are one. Okay? You think, a lot of people think I get saved, I'm off scot-free. Just put it on my tab and I can live however I want and when I get to heaven it's party time. Uh, when you first get to heaven, when we get first get to heaven, there's judgment time. Let that sink in. There's judgment time, not party time. It's judgment time. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. Catching away the body of Christ, we all get judged. Judgment seat of Christ. Okay. 1 Corinthians 3.10, what's that judgment though? Is it sending people to hell? No. But what is that judgment? 1 Corinthians 3.10, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth, buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest. For the day shall be declare it, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. The moment you get saved, Jesus Christ is your foundation. His word is your foundation your foundation. Now your life as a Christian starts. What do you work? What are you building? Right now I've got a lot of junk I believe is going to be burnt up. From the day I was saved to now, there's a lot of junk. I'm working hard to try to, I've always said this in my testimony and I've said it in other videos, when I first got saved I knew how worthless I was. Just completely worthless. And I told the Lord if I if, if I go to heaven and all I do is I have to wash the seats of the saints, because I read it in the Bible once, uh, washing the feet of the saints as they come into the city um, all the time, I, I, I'd do it. Then it got to the point where it's like if I get one copper coin, oh, it would be a blessing, Lord. And then I started studying and God started cleaning up my life and I started, He started showing me things in the Word. It says, no, your heart's supposed to desire more. You're supposed to desire rewards in heaven. You're not looking for that copper coin. You're supposed to be looking for as much as you can get in the life that God gives you. You're supposed to be serving God with all your heart, living the life of Christ. Ultimately, brother and sister Christ, living the life of Christ in the ministry of reconciliation. You get called into ministry to preach the word of God, praise the Lord. But there's some that say, why well, I'm too young, or you know, you have the sisters in Christ out there. You're still serving the Lord by the life that you're living in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, you're earning rewards. Okay. Do good works that are based off of Scripture. You're reading your Bible every day. You're studying your Bible, rightly dividing. Okay, you're living it. You're obeying it. Okay. That's earning rewards. 
You're praying every day. You're there to help the brethren out. To be there for one another. That's earning rewards. But remember, it pleases God when you're earning rewards. It displeases God when your fruit, your work is reprobate. Your good works are reprobate. These false converts. I might do a study someday. I keep talking about it. But I've been reading it, how it talks about how Paul's praying that your works be fruitful. Your good works are fruitful. In other words, you can be saved and you can do good works and they can have zero fruit. That's a whole other study, you know. If you lose your temp, uh, if you use your, lose your, um, what? I can't start with a T. My brain sometimes will freeze on words. But testimony. Okay, you can lose your testimony with people. So no matter how much you try to preach to them, the preaching is a good work. But it's going to be zero fruit. You've lost your testimony. You've screwed up. Let's go to the last one. Righteousness. For this one I put down Matthew 5.10. Okay, we talked about salvation. God's righteousness is puted to you. Jesus Christ is the only one that's righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's people that go about to establish their own righteousness. People always say self-righteous, self-righteous. I'm like chapter and verse where it says self-righteousness. You won't find it. But what the Bible does say is there's people that go about to establish their own righteousness. Establish. They're, found, they're doing a foundation that's other than Jesus Christ. Their foundation is themselves. Their foundation is their flesh. Their foundation is the ways of the world. Whatever. They're going about to establish their own foundation, their own righteousness. It's not self-righteousness. Nobody can have their own righteousness. Except for saved, they can have God's righteousness imputed to them. But nobody... As far as us, wicked sinners, can have righteousness, our own righteousness. There's no such thing as self-righteousness in the Bible. They go about to establish their own righteousness, a different foundation. Okay. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Matthew 5.10 Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what pleases God? When you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, for Jesus' sake. When you're persecuted for the word. How many times you read in the New Testament where the apostles are getting beaten. Thrown in prison. And they're praising God afterwards. They're giving God the glory. It goes back to giving God the glory. It's not about glorifying yourself. It's giving God the glory. Okay. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness. Romans 4.3 what saith the scriptures? Abraham believeth God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. You go to 24, it says, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. I want to read that, because I jumped the gun a little bit. The righteousness that's imputed to you is through salvation. When God saves you, God does the saving. He imputes His righteousness to you. And at that point, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. It pleases God when you stand for the Lord, the real Jesus Christ, in His perfect written word, with the life that you live. It's not enough to do it in words, but you have to do it in deed. Whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. All of it. They both have to go hand in hand. If it's just words, then it's worthless. Where's the deeds to back it up? The life of Christ. Okay, when you live a life of Christ, you're going to suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. Philippians 1.29 For unto you it is given in the, in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And when it happens, like I said, what are the, what's going on? They're, they're, they're giving God glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I've seen this among the body of Christ lately where people are getting bitterness, they're getting um, by, uh, backbiting, uh, they're getting angry and because of persecution. And brothers and sisters in Christ, that's not the proper response when you're getting persecuted for righteousness' sake. You're supposed to give God glory and give God thanks. And we're losing sight of that. 
If you're suffering for Jesus Christ, give God glory. Physical suffering, give Him glory. Spiritual suffering, give Him glory. Give Him glory in all things. and all things glorify God. We we're forgetting that. Okay? 2 Timothy 3.10 Yea, and all that will live, live godly. Deed. And word and deed, the deed, the life change, the life that you're living for the Lord, when it lines up with the Lord, the Word of God. That's what it means. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, you can only do it in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. When you're living a life of Christ because you are in Christ Jesus, He opens this book to you, tells you what to do, what not to do, how to live your life, what you're supposed to believe, what you're supposed to stand for, what you're supposed to rebuke, shun, get out of your life, get away from you. Okay? You're going to suffer persecution. God understands this, but He delights in it. That's my child standing for me and doing what's right. He suffered persecution for my name's sake. It pleases God. He delights in it. Okay? I just really wanted to go through those things because through all those things, it always comes back to what? Jesus Christ. Glorifying Jesus Christ. What were those people doing when they were coming into uh, Corinth? Where Paul had to speak as a fool. They were coming in and glorifying themselves. It wasn't about Jesus Christ. It was about themselves. It was about their flesh. It was going against everything that we were just talking about there. They're trying to destroy people at judgment so that when you go before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, you won't hardly get any rewards. They destroyed your walk when you were down here on this earth. You find suffered fools gladly. Okay? They take the fear of the Lord away from you. So you stop fearing the Lord when you're supposed to fear the Lord. I'll go through all of them. Exercising loving kindness. You might have gotten saved, but in a life of a Christian, uh, God's going to hold you accountable for a lot of things because you're not asking for His forgiveness from your heart. That sorrow, they try to take that sorrow away and go and try to get you to go back under worldly sorrow. What does worldly sorrow lead to? Death. That's why you had godly sorrow and got saved. Okay? They try to get you to stop giving thanks to God and start thanking yourself, the flesh, giving thanks to other men and not giving thanks to God. Okay? Righteousness. You stop uh, being persecuted for righteousness sake because your life starts looking like the lost world. The Lost World stopped, backs off on you because, wait a minute, he might be one of us. He's starting to look like us. He's starting to talk like us. He's starting to act like us. That's why Paul had to speak like a fool. Your walk with the Lord is your number one priority in your life, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I said, walk. Your walk with the Lord. We do videos where it's walk and talk. They go hand in hand. I had some studies in the past. I haven't done any in a while. It's called walk or talk. You know, you got to be both. You can't just be the talk. But all this lines up. You want to please God, you glorify God. And that's what these people are doing in 1 and 2 Corinthians. They're coming in and they're destroying Christians, pulling them away from the real Jesus Christ to worship Satan. And Satan's all about getting you to glorify your flesh and not Jesus Christ. Now, can a professing Christian be a fool? I found some verses that we'll go through real quick and then we're going to end it. Right, can a Christian act like a fool? Talk like a fool? Look like a fool? Okay. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. We talked about this. You look at people's works, you can look at somebody and go, hey, you try to warn a brother or sister in Christ, hey, your works, they're starting to look like the world, like someone who's lost. Okay, your good works are reprobate because you're professing that you know God and you can have good works that are reprobate. So for that verse, here's the point, because I don't want to get confused myself and I don't want to confuse you guys. It's showing that there's good works that can be reprobate. You can do good things according to scripture, but your heart isn't in the right place. That's the first thing. So this is a sign of someone who's false. Flat out false. 
Matthew 10.33 says, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Do we see this? Do we see people falling away saying, Well, I got saved off of the plan of salvation out of the King James Bible, and I worship the Jesus of the King James Bible, but they start straying into falling for a false Jesus, and they start representing a false Jesus to the world. They start doing a, setting a bad example of what a Christian is supposed to be to the world. Can you act foolishly? Okay, Be careful. These are warnings, brothers and sisters Christ. Be careful. Can good works be reprobate? Absolutely. Can good works be unfruitful? Absolutely. Okay. Can you wind up denying men, uh, God with your life that you're living? As a Christian, can you start falling into that trap? God will smack you upside the head and get you back on track. That's the difference between someone who's lost and someone who's saved. But can you start to lean away where you're not representing the Lord properly? Absolutely. Be careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. Stay in the Word of God. Your walk with the Lord is most important. Make sure that you are affirming and not denying the Lord Jesus Christ with your actions. It's not just about words. It's words and deeds. Be careful. Okay? You can lose your testimony with people. In other words, Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. The reason I did that one, with you put up with Matthew 10, 34, if you're denying yourself, you're affirming God. If you're denying God, you're lifting up your flesh. You're affirming yourself. You're lifting up, you're glorifying yourself. You see how that works? If I'm denying myself, I'm glorifying God. Let's say it that way. If I'm denying God, I'm glorifying myself. It's one or the other. You can't have both. Be careful not to fall into the trap that these Christians were falling into, suffering fools gladly, letting lost people come in, and getting them to glorify themselves. And they stop glorifying God. Okay? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about the millennial kingdom. A thousand, we call it the thousand year, it's a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Days is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. The day of the Lord is that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, after the time of Jacob's trouble. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say in me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23, And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye, ye that work iniquity. What's going on there? Their good works are reprobate. God knows the heart. In that time period, it's all going to be about works. But this is evidence, once again, that it's about the heart. God will see the heart. He'll see right through to the heart. People can put on the biggest show all they want behind the cameras on YouTube in these Babel buildings, these men up there. They can put on the biggest show they want. But you know something? God sees their heart. And here's something else that you might not realize, brother, sister, Christ. God will share what He sees about their heart to you. Wait a minute. They're not lining up a scripture. Those of us who are saved, God will show us their heart and say, it's not lining up with Scripture. Stay away from that, man. These Babel buildings, these hirelings in these Babel buildings, wolves in sheep's clothing, stay away from them. They're not lining up with Scripture. Okay? But there it is. The Lord says, I never knew you. Why? Because they were all about glorifying themselves. They did the good works because they had to, not because they wanted to. It wasn't about pleasing God. It was just about, okay, I have no choice. Because in the time of Jacob's trouble, I mean, in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, it's all works. Jesus will be physically present, so there's no more faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Jesus is physically there. There's no more faith. Okay. Brothers and sisters in Christ, is it possible for a saved person to fall into the trap of acting, talking foolishly? Or even fall into the trap of looking foolishly? I believe it's possible. 
God will get you back on track. That's why we have brethren out to correct one another. That's why the Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Here's where the perfect's talking about. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We're here for each other. When you have a brother in Christ correct you in scripture, it's not because he hates you. Okay? It's because we want to see that you don't fall into the trap of looking, acting, or talking foolishly. Looking like the lost world, acting like the lost world, talking like the lost world. Okay? Misrepresenting who Jesus is. We want your walk with the Lord to be strong. I always pray, Lord, that, that you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that your walk with the Lord is stronger than mine. And if it's not, that God gets it up there and it's stronger than mine. I pray that I have a strong walk with the Lord all the time, but I'm always praying, brother, says Christ, that yours is stronger than mine. Why is that? Because that's my goal. To lift the body of Christ up. To encourage the body of Christ when it comes to your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Your prayer life, your reading life, your study life, your living a life of Christ. Okay? Uh, when you say you are acting foolish, you are saying you are acting like a lost person. When you hear somebody say that you are a fool, they're calling you a lost person. So be careful. When you say someone's a fool, there may be enough evidence to say they're lost. Okay, be careful. But when you say someone's acting foolish, what you're saying is they're acting like a lost person. And I know this world likes to destroy all that. That's what the Bible teaches. You're acting foolish because you're acting like someone who's lost. Your foundation isn't God. It isn't Jesus Christ. Whether Old Testament, you're foolish. You're not following God. You're following the ways of the world. New Testament, you're not following God, which is Jesus Christ. You're following the world. Your foundation is something other than Jesus Christ. You, in other words, that's what a fool is. But you can start acting foolish where you start drifting away. The old man, remember Paul warned about not resurrecting the old man. Stay focused. Stay gung-ho for the Lord. Okay. Proverbs 26.11, just to give you an example of um, Proverbs 26.11, I want to turn there. Of a fool. I found this very interesting. Proverbs 26.11. Where's the back? Remember what we read. Let's go ahead and read 4 again. 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. It's all about him, feeling his opinions. He's wise in himself, not the Lord. Now jump down to verse 11. Paul warned these people. Okay, he told them the truth from the very beginning, he reiterated the truth, he had to speak like a fool to open their eyes. This is the best example on how to do it. He had, there was a purpose to it. He didn't lie to them when he spoke as a fool. But he was saying, I'm speaking as a fool because he's making it out like, I could glorify myself if I want to. I could le elevate myself higher than these guys that are elevating themselves. Way higher. But I'm nothing. It's all about Jesus Christ. Okay. Verse 11 says, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. I don't know. Some of those people there that Paul was talking to, they might have went right back to saying, to their folly. Those fools could have gotten saved. The ones that they're suffering gladly. I believe a lot of them probably went back to their folly. Because Paul had a hard time with first, the, the church of Corinth in First and Second Corinthians. The church of Corinth, Paul had a hard time with them. They were very fleshly. Had a lot of false converts coming in. Messing them up. Okay. Is that going to happen today? You're going to look like you're going to reach somebody. You're talking to somebody. You're trying to preach to them. And what happens? Next thing you know, the fool has returned to his folly. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to have anything to do with you. You can see in their eyes and their proud look that they've talked themselves out of conviction. And you're trying to help them. Whether it's preaching the plan of salvation to them or you're trying to reach somebody you think is saved and you're trying to talk to them about the Word of God, and there's something in their life that isn't right, what happens? A fool returneth to his folly. Someone who's saved is going to heed the Word of God. The Holy Spirit's going to be in. They're going to be convicted. And their Holy Spirit, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit bears witness with your Holy Spirit. 
So when you come and correct them, your Holy Spirit's going to bear witness, then my Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in me, is going to bear witness. What their person's telling me is right. I need to get this out of my life. But I found that interesting because it says, A dog returned to his vomit. It likens a dog to a fool. Remember what it says in 2 Peter 2.22? says, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. What are we reading? Proverbs 26, 11. True proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Okay. You have people that you try to preach the plan of salvation to, you think you're reaching them, and then next thing you know, they'll just turn and go right back into the world hardcore. Okay. In the time of Jacob's trouble... Uh, that's a, this is, like I said, sometimes when you read this, time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. A lot of people are going to become dogs that got saved. They lost their salvation because they took that mark of the beast so they could go back to their folly. So they can go back to living the way they used to live. They take the mark of the beast and they worship the beast. They return to their own folly. The full return to his folly. God looks at them as dogs. Okay, today false converts, God looks at them as dogs. These fools, they return to their folly. You preach the plan of salvation to them, you try to preach the true word of God to them, and they turn around and go, well, I don't want it. I'm going to run back to the world. I'm going to run back to my flesh. I'm going to go back to glorifying myself, my flesh. My foundation is not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's me. I can be my own God so on and so forth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is very serious what was going on there. Paul wasn't making light of it. He wasn't making a joke when he was speaking as a fool. He was making a point. It wasn't something for everybody to be laughing about. It was serious. You had fools coming in, professing to be saved, messing up the body of Christ, getting them to glorify themselves and not the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's happening time and time again today. I see it. Brethren fall away. Brethren are getting in fights. It's all about the flesh. Flesh, 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 flesh. It's not about the Word of God. Sometimes it is, but for the most part, I'm seeing the part of this falling away. A lot of them are falling away. They're trying to, they're being, well, I'm being told I can have this world and be a Christian. And we're seeing a lot of false converts that are coming to light more than anything. But I also believe that there's some that are saved that are falling away. Okay, and my plea to those that are saved, don't fall for those people like Paul did. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Don't act like a fool. You're supposed to be saved, so you don't be a fool, but don't act like a fool. Don't let them destroy your testimony. Don't let them destroy your walk with the Lord. There's nothing in this world that's worth destroying your walk with the Lord. There's nothing in this world that's worth you losing your testimony with people. It's not worth it. Okay? It's very rare that you'd have to speak as a fool. I want to point that out real quick. Paul didn't speak like a fool all the time. Be careful that you're not being sarcastic all the time. Okay? That you're not speaking as a fool all the time. Paul didn't do it all the time. It was rare. And it was very serious when he did it. Very serious. Not something that you just joke around about and get a good laugh about. It is serious. Okay? You're not supposed to act like a fool as a Christian. You're not to look like a fool as a Christian. And you're definitely not to talk like a fool as a Christian. Okay? Paul was warning him. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope this has helped you. Lift you up. Help you evaluate your life and everything. And remember that when you answer a fool according to his folly, it's because he's trying to be wise in his own conceit. Remember what conceit means. We read that in the verse back here too, where it said, Proverbs 16, 30, 11, where it says, As a dog returned to his vomit, so a fool returned to his folly. Verse 12 says, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. I didn't read verse 12. There's more hope of a fool than him. When you have someone who's flat out lost, they're not wise, they're not, they know they're not wise, they know they're not smart, and they just flat out are lost, there's more hope 
that verse is a big verse to prove that it's hard to deal with these false converts. Someone who's flat out lost, who knows they're not smart and they're not wise in their own conceit, they're easier to reach for Jesus Christ than these professing Christians out there that hold to a fake Jesus, that hold to a false sense of security, that believe they've been liberated, they have liberty, they've been liberated from the law of sin and death because they've been promised it, but they're still under the law of sin and death. Right there is a great verse for that. They're next to impossible to deal with. And that's what we're dealing with. Most of the people I deal with aren't people that flat out reject Jesus Christ. I'd have to say 90 plus percent of the people that I deal with are people in false religion. Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, professing, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. You know, they profess it, but in works they deny it. They're not Bible-believing with their works. They do not fear God with their works. Okay? Those are the people that I deal with the most. It's hard to come across somebody that's not, that has no, no knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who's that? You ask somebody, have you ever heard the name Jesus Christ? Everybody I've ever come across will say yes. That in itself tells me we're in the last days. We're just, Jesus Christ is going to come back any day now, okay? So when you're going to use this, get back to the study, when you're going to use this verse, make sure you're applying it properly. Make sure you're using it sparingly, okay? And according to his folly, lest his be wise in his own conceit. Now people, one thing i got to point out that if I didn't make this clear, people will try to say they use that to have lost people. Was G, uh, Paul talking, addressing those fools that they are suffering gladly? Or was he addressing the actual Christians that were there? He was addressing the Christians. So when, he, when you answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit today, for today, for that apply, you do it for Christians. You answer a Christian as a, and you speak as a fool towards a Christian, someone who's saved, to get him back on the right track. You don't do it to someone who's lost. It's worthless. It's pointless. You're casting pearls before swine. What's going to happen? They're going to come back and they're going to rend you. See, look how he acted. Look how he spoke. Look how he's, It's just going to come back to, to hurt you in the end. You don't cast pearls before swine. Right? You don't speak like a fool to lost people. You preach the plan of salvation to them. They want it or they don't want it. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You rebuke them and you call them out. But Paul was speaking to saved who he believed was saved. And he separated the two. Everybody that was professing to be saved, he separated them and dressed those that were saved and called the others fools. You're suffering fools gladly. Brethren, don't suffer fools gladly. Okay? And remember, this was done to edify the body of Christ, to lift the body of Christ up, to get them back on the right track. So I'm going to go ahead and end this study with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus. Stand, stand, stand. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Pray for the brethren. We all need prayer in these last days and especially with everything that's going on out there. So I will see you in the next study.